So this is basically like Jello. Um, it's got some nutrients in it. It's a Friday it afternoon, and, and Jay Keesling, head of the Joint smoke. Bioenergy Institute at UC Berkeley, is turning what's in this in petri dish in into fuel that could one day power our cars. Each one of these colonies has a huge number, a billion or more cells, and they grow up and they produce fuel. Kiesling may make it sound easy, but it took scientists more than 40 years of genetic research to lay the foundation for what he's doing now, essentially turning tiny microbes into mini factories, each capable of turning out fuel. It's called synthetic biology. A microbe is like yeast, so it's a lot like brewing beer, except we've changed the chemistry inside the cell so they don't produce alcohol, they produce hydrocarbons, hydrocarbons that are identical to gasoline or diesel fuel or jet fuel. The idea is to use sugar from plants like switchgrass or pine trees to power the microbes, creating a new renewable energy source. So what's the promise of these biofuels that you're working on? One is the amount of carbon dioxide put into the atmosphere. We're adding more and more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and we are getting global climate change as a result of that. So we have this uh, opportunity with biofuels that we can be carbon neutral. Another advantage is economics. Uh, right now we send a huge amount of money over to unstable parts of the world um, uh, to buy petroleum to turn it into gasoline. If we have biofuels, there's a good chance that those biofuels will be produced in the U.S from biomass that's grown in the U.S. and farms in the U.S. So rather than sending our money to the Mideast, we could send it to the Midwest. Kiesling grew up in the Midwest. He's a self-described Nebraska farm boy. And it's an upbringing that gives him extra insight when answering critics who say using plants for fuel could hurt the food supply. We're trying to uh, make fuels that are usable in all of the transportation infrastructure that we have right now. So we're trying to take waste products and turn them into something useful and at the same time do something that's good for the environment. And it's not just fuel. Kiesling's work with microbes led him to tackle another of the world's big problems, malaria. There are somewhere between 300 and 500 million people infected with malaria and in any one year between one and three million people die of malaria and 90 percent are children under the age of five. And they die because they don't have access to inexpensive drugs. There's a drug that has a great history. It's called artemisinin. It's an ancient Chinese therapy. So a few years ago, uh, we were working on engineering E. coli and yeast. And we learned about this drug and looked at the structure of it. It's a hydrocarbon. Um, and we thought, gosh, that's something we might be able to produce. Kiesling and his team shopped the idea to pharmaceutical companies who turned them down. But the Gates Foundation stepped in with a $42 million grant. We don't know how many deaths we'll prevent um, from uh, using this drug, but we have the potential of saving a million children a year. It's going to take uh, inexpensive drugs, which we hope we've got the answer to. It's going to take vaccines. It's going to take bed nets. It's going to take new pesticides to spray uh, the mosquitoes so that they don't live and don't transmit it. But the combination of all those together means that we could wipe malaria off the map. That desire to put science to work is what Professor Kiesling is trying to inspire in the researchers who work in his Berkeley lab. I think he has that kind of um, innovation or that kind of thinking where he's like, okay, you know, we can apply this to something that, that can be useful. Now it's at a point where we don't have to accept what nature has given us. We don't have to accept that yeast produces ethanol. We can change the chemistry inside yeast and get it to produce nearly any chemical we want. When you say things like, we don't have to accept what nature has given us, it might seem like you're trying to play God or that this is sort of too much power or too much change. Can you understand that concern? I do understand that concern, and, and you see it whenever there's a technology developed. But a lot of these capabilities have been around for 40 years. What we're trying to do with synthetic biology is make the engineering of biology more reliable. Walk through the lab with Kiesling now, and it's easy to see how committed he is to using science to solve real problems, and how far he thinks that farm background has taken him. It gave me great work ethic, and you know now I look at my work and I think, gosh, it could never be as hard as scooping hog manure <laughs> on a hot Nebraska summer day. And so um, everything you, looks easier. 
But you don't tackle small problems. We only have one life. Why not tackle some really hard things? We're working on problems that are big problems. We're taking big risks. Some of the things are going to fail. And if a fraction of the things aren't failing, a measurable fraction aren't failing, then we're not taking big enough risks. Tabitha Soren, Bloomberg, Berkeley, California. Really?